What's up, y'all? Professor Hurley here with another episode of Purple Bear Biology, where we talk about microbiology, anatomy and physiology, and biology of life. If you're new to the channel, but you love all those topics, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to see additional videos as I release them. In this video, we get to talk about the skeletal system. Now, when a lot of people think about the skeletal system, they think of the anatomy of the body. If you are looking for a video about anatomy and skeletal system and how to name bones and bone features, then look down in the description section below and you'll find a video link where I created a video for that. In this video, what we're going to talk about is something equally as exciting, bone physiology. Have you ever wondered how bone grows? How about whether or not bone is actually alive? What about the mysteries of bone repair and fracture? In this video, we're going to explore those concepts and some other really cool physiologies. Let's start by laying the foundation to build this physiology conversation with the actual functions of the skeletal system. Immediately, most people think of structure and support. No doubt, this is one of the primary functions. Bone provides the scaffolding needed to support your body and anchor points for the muscles to attach. Without points of attachment, muscles would not be able to produce movements around joints. Another common function that most people would predict would be protection. Bones wrap around vital organs like the skull for the brain and ribs for the lungs and heart. Without these protective structures, small bumps could be fatal. But bone does so much more than just hold you up and protect your organs. Bone acts as a storage site for minerals like calcium. Think of bone like bank. Your body can store calcium in your skeletal system by building bone or withdraw it later by breaking bone down. Bone building is referred to as bone deposition, and bone breakdown is called bone resorption. Outside of just mineralized bone itself, the skeletal system is also a location where we can find bone marrow. Bone marrow can be divided into red bone marrow that is responsible for making red blood cells, and yellow bone marrow that is the location of fat storage in the form of triglycerides. Cool fact alert! Did you know that the amount of red bone marrow in your body changes as you grow from childhood to adulthood? Slowly over time, red bone marrow is converted to yellow bone marrow. Why in the world would the body switch from red cell producing marrow over to fat storage sites when you get older? Well, one reason is when you're a child, you have a higher developmental demand for growth. And that requires more red blood cells to support all that growth. However, after reaching adulthood, we do not need the additional red blood cells, and so our body converts this resource into an energy storage site. Isn't that awesome? But it gets so much cooler. Check out this awesomeness. Your bone is actually full of all sorts of materials besides, well, bone itself. In addition to marrow, we can find blood and vessels delivering nutrients to the bone cells and nerves monitoring bone stress and use. And all of that is just woven into the bone tissue. The bone tissue, also known as osteous tissue, is a marvel to behold in its own. It is a composition of both flexible organic parts called collagen fibers and hard inorganic parts composed of calcium and phosphorus in the form of a compound called hydroxyapatite. You can see its chemical formula down here. It's primarily calcium and phosphates. Now one of the cool things about bone is that in order to function properly it must be strong enough to support movement but flexible enough to avoid breaking under strain. If both of these components are balanced correctly you get an amazing structure that's strong and versatile. However, if you change the proportions of the organic and inorganic parts it can change the properties of the bone structure itself. For example, if all of the collagen fibers are removed from bone, it loses its flexibility and becomes brittle. There are some genetic disorders where this becomes a reality. One example is osteogenesis imperfecta. The bone becomes brittle like glass. These patients will experience multiple breaks throughout their lives. There are even varying degrees of osteogenesis imperfecta, and the most severe cases, individuals don't even survive birth. On the opposite side, if we move all of the inorganic material and leave just the flexible collagen fibers, then we get bones that are way too flexible. So-called soft bones tend to break when they bend. Many bones occur in both adults and children. In children, this condition is called rickets disease and is due to vitamin D deficiency. The deficiency could be dietary, but it can also be due to a lack of sunlight. If you don't remember how vitamin D is connected to sunlight, Check out the integumentary system video that I have linked below. 
Now, when this condition occurs in adults, we call it osteomalacia. Don't confuse osteomalacia with osteoporosis. We will get to osteoporosis in a minute, but before we do, we need to take a deeper look into bone structure. Let's dive into the cellular level now. Inside your bones, you have four primary types of bone cells. These cells are responsible for monitoring bone condition and building bone or breaking it down as needed. Our little osteogenic friends here serve as the stem cells to create osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Osteoblasts are our bone builders. When activated, osteoblasts attract in calcium and phosphorus to make hydroxyapatite crystals, forming hard bone. We have refer to these bone builders as bone deposition. I remember all of this because blasts build bone, and calcium, like a currency, can be deposited into a bank. Osteoclasts, in contrast, break down and free up calcium in the process of resorption. I remember this because if I need cash, I have to go to the bank. So if the body needs calcium, it uses class to get the cash, aka the calcium. Crazy fact about all of this is that the bones of our skeletal system are continuously undergoing bone resorption and deposition. This is referred to as bone remodeling. On average, our skeleton replaces about 10% of our bones every year. Considering this average, your entire skeleton could be rebuilt every 10 years. Now, of course, these are just averages. What really determines how fast bone gets broken down and built depends on numerous individual factors that are patient-specific. But it is pretty darn cool to think that our entire skeleton system will be rebuilt during our lives. With all this building and breaking down, what in the world determines where bone gets built? A model proposed by a German surgeon, Julius Wolff, explains how this works. He suggested that bone would be built where it's needed and broken down where it is not utilized. The principle is referred to as Wolf's Law. Bone condition is continuously being monitored, and if bone is placed under strain or stress, then osteoblasts build bone in that area. Conversely, if you don't use it, you lose it. Bones that do not experience strain will be broken down by osteoclasts. The function of osteoclasts and osteoblasts are in a delicate balance. Too much of either can dynamically affect the integrity of bone as a whole. The most common example of this disruption balance would be osteoporosis and Paget's disease. Osteoporosis represents when the osteoclast activity surpasses the osteoblast activity. The increased breakdown makes the bones more brittle and more likely to break. This is a common disorder frequently developing when estrogen levels are low a condition that is also very common as women transition through menopause. Estrogen helps suppress bone remodeling and breakdown. When the levels drop too low, the osteoclast activity is less regulated, and this leads to porous spaces in the bone, leading to a reduction in strength and density. Similarly, Paget's disease results from a malfunctioning bone cells. Osteoblasts build bone in the places that they're not needed, and osteoclasts break it down in areas that it needs to remain strong. The results is that bones are misshapen and weak. While the exact cause of Paget's disease are still actively being investigated, it's likely that there is a strong genetic component in combination with certain environmental conditions. Wow! Isn't bone disease fascinating? Now let's switch gears and take a look at some of the features that we can find in bone structure. Bones vary in shape and size, but let's use long bones to explore their general structure. As a whole, we can see that long bones can be divided into two main types of areas. The ends, called the epiphysis, and then the primary shaft, called the diaphysis. In an adult, the epiphysis contains the red bone marrow and the diaphysis contains a long canal called the medullary cavity that houses the yellow bone marrow. If we look closer, we can see that these areas actually have osseous tissue arranged in two different ways. Along the border of the bones, the tissue is arranged in a very compact way to increase the bone strength. This is pleasantly called compact bone. As we move deep into the bone, we find that the osseous tissue gets more spread out with spaces to house the bone marrow. This arrangement is called spongy bone. This arrangement of bone is not just found in log bones. It's found in flat bones as well. This basic design is implemented in all of the bones throughout the body. Here you can see how the skull superficially has compact bone and deep has an arrangement of spongy bone. Now let's jump into the complete anatomy app that I've used in previous videos to go even closer and see compact bone and spongy bone. 
If you haven't seen this app, be sure to look in the description section for a link to their website. It's super awesome and it's cool to get to explore anatomy in this way. Here we have a sagittal section of the diaphysis of a long bone. Looking at it from the superior side, you can see compact bone arranged superficially and spongy bone arranged deep. This is yellow bone marrow found in the medullary cavity. Let's hide it for a second to see what else is inside of the medullary cavity. If we zoom in, you can see that this is an area that is filled with blood vessels to provide the bone cells with nutrients and remove waste, as well as having nerve cells to help communicate the amount of stress a bone is under. If we move more laterally and zoom in a little more, we can see a clear difference between the spongy bone in the medullary cavity and the compact bone along the edge. Notice that the compact bone looks like several repeating circles placed next to each other. Each of these shapes is actually an elongated cylinder called an osteon. Let's take a closer look at an osteon to see what it actually looks like isolated. If we were to pull one osteon out, you can see that it actually looks like multiple layers. Each of these layers is referred to as a lamella. Down the center of the osteon, we have a central canal where individual vessels and nerves flow. If we go even closer, we can see that each layer of the osteon has spaces in it called lacunae. These lacunae actually house a cell called an osteocyte in the center. I know what you're thinking. Now wait a minute, Professor Hurley. We only talked about osteogenic cells, osteoblast cells, and osteoclasts. What in the world is an osteocyte? Well, I am glad that thought crossed your mind. Let me explain. See, osteoblasts build bone, but they build it all around themselves. It is kind of like painting yourself into a corner. Once the osteoblasts build bone around themselves and are trapped, they become osteocytes, and their new function is to monitor bone condition and stress. Now, don't get the impression that osteocytes are completely isolated. They still need nutrients and produce waste. They also have to communicate with the nervous system and the other cells around them. If we look at our model again, you can see that there are actually tiny channels that lead from cell to cell and to the central canal. These channels are called canaliculi and allow the cell to communicate with one another as well as transport materials in and out of the lacunae space. Conveniently, spongy bone is organized in a similar way, except it forms channels called trabeculae instead of having closely packed osteons. There's also no central canal through the trabeculae, but this is because the medullary cavity has vessels that can provide these cells with nutrients and waste removal. So now we know what builds bone and why bone gets built in particular places. But what about bone growth? Did you know that when you are born, you actually have more bones in your body than when you're an adult? This creates the soft spots on a baby's skull. Why would that be? Well. One really good reason is that babies' bodies must be flexible enough to squeeze through the birth canal. So, we are born with bones broken up into segments, joined together with connective tissue. After you are born, the body starts to fuse these bones together by building bone to replace the membranes in between. When bone grows in this way, it's called intermembranous ossification. Intermembranous growth is not how we get taller or our bones get wider. This is called endochondral ossification. This type of bone growth can either be appositional, causing the bone to get thicker, or interstitial, causing the bones to get longer. Interstitial endochondral ossification involves replacing cartilage cells with bone cells found at the junction of the epiphysis and the diaphysis. This site is referred to as the epiphyseal plate and is commonly referred to as the growth plate. The way that this works is actually pretty neat. See, before we are adults, in between the epiphysis and the diaphysis, there is a cartilage layer that will actively divide, pushing cells above them up and away. This elongates the bone as it shifts the epiphysis away from the diaphysis. Osteoblasts then get recruited to the area to replace the cartilage cells with a bone matrix. Elongation in this way only takes place until the growth plate closes. Once the cartilage cell division slows and all of the cartilage cells are replaced with bone, the growth plate is said to have closed and will no longer grow in length. There are two really fascinating bone diseases that are associated with endochondral ossification. One of the ways that your body regulates bone growth is with growth hormone. If your body produces too much growth hormone early in life, the bones grow extremely fast and long. 
This leads to something called gigantism. On the other hand, if hormone levels are low, this could result in a form of dwarfism. Both of those happen while the growth plate is open. But if growth hormones become elevated after the growth plate closes, then the bone will get wider instead of longer. This condition is referred to as agromegaly. You may have noticed a trend with bone building. We have discussed bone being built on existing bone, connective membranes between bone, and replacing cartilage cells. In all cases, bone must be built on an existing structure and is not built into open space. This is fundamental to understand why breaks take an extended time to heal. When bones break, the first step is for cells to rush to the area. Cells involved in clotting the area are there to help prevent blood loss, and then cartilage cells begin to build a cartilage scaffold. Why does a cartilage scaffold have to be laid down? Because without a scaffold, osteoblasts cannot build new bone to fill in the break. Over a period of weeks to months, cartilage gets replaced to form new bone in the area. One of the cool ways that medicine is trying to speed up the healing process is by providing the scaffold for the osteoblast to build on. This includes things like placing bone putty or 3D printed scaffolds within the structure. Isn't bone mind blowing? I hope you found this video to be helpful introduction to bone physiology and structure. If you liked it, be sure to click the like button and subscribe so that we can continue to have our conversations about bone and how the endocrine system regulates remodeling. Thanks for watching and see you next time.